Thanks for joining us online today. We hope you're blessed by this message. If you have a prayer need today, please visit our website, SiouxFallsFirst.com. Now let me have you be really honest this morning. How many of you stayed up past midnight? Wow. Then the early bird gets the worm today because uh, you were able to get here first service. I know, again, as Pastor Tyler said, some of the partiers will show up second service. Some of those that stayed up a little bit later. I was trying to sleep, but my neighbor, my neighbor decided to let off all these fireworks, like uh, from midnight till one in the morning. Um, so experienced a little bit of that. But man, I'm excited about what God is going to do in 2017. You know, I think of the scripture that says that his mercies are new every morning. And I think about how even when we come into a new year, we know God has new mercies for us. We know there's things that God's going to accomplish in 2017 in your life, in my life, in the life of our church that he hasn't yet done, that, that God is going to do something new among us. And, and so I pray this morning, even as we meet together, gather together on this first Sunday of the year, that there's anticipation in your heart for what God wants to do, because we know that God always meets us at our level of expectation. Amen. So would you pray with me? Father, we love you today, and we thank you for this awesome opportunity on the first Sunday of the year, God, to honor you, to be in the seat of a disciple. Lord, literally to gather around the table of your word and take nourishment and hear what you want to speak to us. I pray the next few moments we have together, Lord, that any distraction around us would be laid aside. And Father, we would be able to be intentionally focused on, God, what you want to deposit in our spirit, what you want to speak into our life, what you want to speak into our church. Lord, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said amen. Amen. We're going to begin in a few moments in the Old Testament book of Habakkuk chapter 2. So you can turn there. It'll also be on the screen. And then we'll be going a few different places throughout uh, the morning. But how many of you have ever had a car that you've driven out of alignment? Anybody? That it doesn't matter how straight the highway is, the tendency of that vehicle is to veer into the ditch unless you continually compensate for the misalignment. Even routine driving will cause the um, the springs to shrink, to, to stretch, excuse me, will cause the tires to wear unevenly, and will even cause the internal components of the vehicle to be affected in a negative way. You see, alignment is indispensable to the condition and the direction of that vehicle. The same is true in the church. We're starting a series this morning on the mission, our mission to lead people into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, including our values with testimonies and action steps to help us align with the vision that God has given us as a church. You see, over the last year or so, our staff has been seeking God in prayer and prayer storming about who we are as a church. So we will know what God wants to do in our midst and where God wants to lead us in 2017 and beyond. In fact, we're calling January Vision Month. Because over the next several weeks, you're going to hear some of those things that God has deposited, God has spoken to our hearts. It's going to be a little bit of a a bird's eye view because that was a whole lot of staff meetings. But today is going to be a little different. The next few weeks are going to be a little different because it's going to be like we are inviting you into our staff meeting, even using a whiteboard, and I'll just prepare you ahead of time. My handwriting is like chicken scratch. That's why I type everything. So somebody else wrote this, but I will occasionally try to discern uh, a word that you can understand and and share what God has placed in our hearts. But I'm excited about today. Um, So in the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, 
Let me share a little bit of what was going on. The prophet Habakkuk was really struggling with what was happening in the nation of Israel. He was frustrated. He was complaining to God, and he felt like God was not listening to him. And he comes into Habakkuk chapter 2, and he lets the Lord know, I'm setting myself up on the rampart or the wall to hear what you're going to speak to me. To know where you want to lead me, to where you want to lead the people of God, what you want to deposit in us. So in many ways, it is a similar scene to where we have been as a church because we as a staff are saying, God, we want to know where you want to take us. We don't want to just have meetings. We want to have great intentionality to what we do. And, 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 and obviously, we, we want to follow the Spirit of God. And we know that God is faithful to lead us if we will be faithful to follow Him. It's the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, the leadership and direction of the Holy Spirit. And if we will follow him and if we will submit to him, he will lead us wherever he wants to take us. And that's our heart. So it's interesting what happens in chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, because it says, Then the Lord answered me and said, Record the vision or write down the vision. And inscribe it on tablets. They didn't have all the technology that we enjoy today. They didn't have Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat. They didn't have the the modern technology. So he said, write it on tablets. That the one who reads it may run. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens toward the goal. And it will not fail. God-given visions don't fail. Though it tarries, wait for it. For it certainly will come, it will not delay. So as I read this passage, but as I read several other passages throughout Scripture, I understand that vision is important to God. It's something that He imparts into us To give us direction arrows of where we need to go. You see, knowing who we are will help us. It'll help us know what to say no to. So that it will empower us to what we need to say yes to. It will create an action step for us. That he may run who reads it. When we are able to articulate clear vision, then everybody knows how to respond to what God is speaking to the house. And our heart is to clarify that vision to help us as a church to move together the direction that God has called us to go. You see, knowing who we are also will help us establish the culture to achieve the vision. To basically be able to prepare ourselves for what God wants to do in our midst. Again, not only in 2017, but beyond that. Knowing who we are helps us know what to celebrate. It helps us know what to cherish. But it also helps us know how to change our world beyond the gathering. You see, there's a whole lot more time between Sundays than there is on Sunday morning. There's a whole lot more time that God wants to redeem in His people. Don't get me wrong, there is so much power in us coming together, gathering together to lift up the name of Jesus, to celebrate what God is doing among us, to build those relationships. But that power is accelerated When we all walk out of this building, we drive off this campus, and we live out the same values every day all across this region. There's tremendous power in being on the same page. And we'll talk a little bit about unity, but it brings us into unity. So as I was preparing for this, I was reminded of the gathering in the upper room. 
when 120 obedient Christ followers entered into a prayer meeting and stayed there seeking the promise of the Father. They really didn't know what was going to happen. There was no preset, determined picture of what it was going to look like. But they went into that upper room in unity and sought the promise of the Father. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit was poured out upon that gathering. And I find it tremendously interesting that people on the outside were looking in. They were listening. They were inquisitive. Just like the world that we live in today. Wondering what really happens in that church. Observing and even observing our lives. But they did not stay in the gathering. They left the upper room. They scattered all across the region where they took what God gave them elsewhere. And it's interesting, but before the upper room even happened, the day of Pentecost had fully come, Jesus had already given them their vision. He had already told them the values that they were to live by and to walk out the remaining of their days when he said in Matthew 28, 19, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, even on days when you don't feel like it, I will be with you. I will be with you to the very end of the age. So it's interesting, they knew the value, they knew what they were supposed to be doing, even though it seemed like this gigantic responsibility for these ones that knew Jesus was going to be leaving them. And yet after they received the power with the purpose, amazing things happened. You see, as... They left the upper room. They saw explosive growth and the gospel, as the gospel moved out of Jerusalem and into the regions of Judea and Samaria, that literally there was explosive growth as they went on their mission to make disciples. God moved in their midst because they were on the same page. You see, really, that's what leading life change is all about. And I feel like in my heart that God is helping us realign with really the true mission of the New Testament church is. And so over these next few weeks, we're going to be sharing some of those values. Today, we're going to be sharing two values. The values of being spirit-empowered and biblically-based. A man by the name of David Watson once said... No word, all spirit, you'll blow up. No spirit, all word, you'll dry up. But spirit and word together, you will grow up. I think of it as two wings of an airplane. That airplane is not going to fly without the wings. And yet we know the airplane will not fly with just one wing. You need both of those wings to get the energy to get into the air and to be able to fly. That's why being spirit-empowered and biblically based is absolutely critical for us to ascend to those places that God wants us to be. And the reason they are first is because they are foundational. They're absolutely imperative. If you don't have these... You can mark off the others. So the first one being spirit empowered. Now we can go to Acts chapter 1. And we see that in verse 8. Jesus was preparing his disciples for the upper room. And he told them that when the power came upon them. When the Holy Spirit came upon them. There would be a deposit of power in them. That would enable them to take this life-changing message of the gospel, the resurrected Christ, to the 
people of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the uttermost parts of the earth. And as we read through the book of Acts, we see that happen. We see this multiplication effect. We see more churches, and we see more disciples, and we see more impact because they are following the same vision. They're following what Christ had told them to do, and they have this power behind them to see it happen. But then you get to Acts chapter 8, verse 14, and it says, when the gospel reaches Samaria, it says the the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God. So, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. Why was that necessary? Because they were going to inspect the fruit. They were going to observe what was happening there. Is this the same gospel? Is this the transformative work of the Holy Spirit happening in their midst? And when they got there, they found out it was. Again, it was a result of their immediate obedience. You see, they were able to measure what God gave them because the vision and the values that God gives us are supposed to be measured. You see, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit is what qualified them to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ with results. They were able to see the fruition of what God deposited in their hearts. Even as Saul, you remember when Saul and And these religious leaders came up against them. And we know eventually killed and martyred Stephen. And we we see that they drugged them out of their homes and and killed many Christians. And, and, And we know that that's happening across the world today. But it happened in this context. And even as the enemy applied the vice grips, even as the enemy pressured them, it would seem like It only caused more growth. It only accelerated what was happening because the Holy Spirit had empowered them. I will tell you that life change only happens by the power of the Holy Spirit. Life change only happens in a church or in a city or in a state or in a nation by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the only way it transforms a campus. It's the only way it transforms a family. It's the only way it transforms a workplace. Is the power of the Holy Spirit. In fact, I find it interesting that Paul was challenging the Galatian believers, many of them new believers who had been caught up in their works and and they give their lives to Christ. They had experienced the work of grace in their hearts by the power of the Spirit. And Paul was challenging them not to go back, not to depend upon the works of the law or by their own flesh to complete what God had started inside of them. In fact, here's what he says in Galatians 3.3. 3 which I believe also applies to the unfinished task of global evangelism, of reaching to the uttermost parts of the earth. He said, are you so foolish? He said, after beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Hey, what God did in that upper room, when he deposited the very Spirit of God, when he benefited us with the person of the Holy Spirit, we understand what literally transformed and grew the early church is still absolutely necessary for us to advance the cause of Christ, the resurrected Christ, wherever we go. It's essential for us to see what God wants to accomplish in our midst happen. You know, we really need to understand that it's not going to happen 
by our human ingenuity, by our wisdom, by our smarts. It's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. Minister Andrew Murray once said, men ought to seek with their whole hearts to be filled with the spirit of God. Without being filled with the spirit of God, it is utterly impossible that an individual Christian or a church can ever live or work as God desires. You see, every single one of us this morning, and I feel the same way corporately, God has given us a blueprint. God has placed His own dreams upon our lives and how He wants to use us and how He wants to use this church to impact not only Sioux Falls, but make a global dent in the kingdom of darkness all around the world. And yet, it only happens by the power of the Spirit. In fact, what we read in here will only come into being by the Spirit of God. In fact, I was thinking this morning about the work of the Holy Spirit in creation. And it says in Genesis 1-2, when the earth was formless and void and empty, that the Holy Spirit hovered, brooded over the face of the waters. The image is a hen that is really sitting upon her eggs in order to hatch them, in order to bring forth life. If you even go to the recent Christmas story where we talked about Mary, and again, it's talking about the Holy Spirit brooding over or hovering over Mary. And it was by the power of the Spirit that the physical body of Jesus was brought to this earth who would become the sacrifice for our sins. In the same way, the Holy Spirit is the one that performs the Word of God in our midst. Brings it into being. Brings it into fruition. The power of the Holy Spirit. And so when you think about it, To deny the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit is really convenient theology. Because it becomes an excuse of powerlessness. That when we say the Holy Spirit is not active today and the Holy Spirit's not moving today, He doesn't do what He used to do. Then we've conditioned ourselves to live within a, under a lid. And in a place that God never intended for us to live. God wants us to remove the lid. God wants to live lives of miracles and impossibilities. God wants us to live lives of great expectations. God wants us individually and as families and even as a church to begin to enter in dimensions that we never even thought possible in the natural. But God is able to bring them forth supernaturally because of the power of the Spirit. I will tell you, in every ministry in our church, we want to be a church where the Spirit of God is hovering. Whether it's our foster care ministry, our children's ministry, our youth ministry, it's our young adult ministry, our worship ministry, whether it be in the office or in the, in the offices of our staff, it doesn't matter. We want the Holy Spirit to be brooding over, hovering over, to bring into action those things that He has established for us To experience. I believe the best days are ahead. I believe the greatest miracles are yet to be revealed. I believe God is raising up his church and preparing his church for this last day outpouring, this move of God that will bring forth his gospel in ways that will absolutely make the world look upon it with shock and awe. I believe he's going to do that. But we need the power of the Spirit in the church. And I think it's so easy for American churches today to tap into worldly measures just to get a crowd. And that's their gauge of success. And don't get me wrong, I love crowds and I love to see people come and I, you know, I'm, I'm allergic to empty seats too. But I think it's so easy to, to depend upon these worldly measures 
this powerless living instead of depending on the power of the Holy Spirit to help us make disciples. Because even as Matt Carpenter said, discipleship is the mustard seed conspiracy. That it's the smallest seed that produces the largest tree in the garden. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen immediately. It's not a microwave thing. It's not instant oatmeal. But it's saying, God, we understand that when we align with your purpose and your vision, God, that the growth will be exponential and the growth will be steady. And and here's what I'm saying. The Holy Spirit is all about producing eternal fruit, not seasonal replicas. Not these things that are flash pots and come and go. He wants us to make strong disciples, Christ followers, who will love Jesus even through the storm. We need the power of the Holy Spirit for that. In fact, I, uh, I just wanted to share this with you. These are the things that I really believe that God wants to make common in his church again. Got this email, and I believe he would permit me to share this. If not, Bill, I apologize. Bill Anderson is an awesome pillar and sage warrior in this church. In fact, that guy came when there was ice all over the parking lot and and struggled to get in, but he was here. God, give us more Bill Andersons. But he sent this to me just a few weeks ago. He said, last December, David Sellers, my grandson-in-law in Ohio, was seriously injured. While building an apartment over his garage for visiting missionaries or others who needed a place to stay, he made a misstep and fell through the sheetrock on the garage ceiling 12 feet to the floor. His left arm was so badly damaged that doctors considered amputation. His Back was injured as well. Last January, when Sam Farina challenged us to write down those things that we are believing God for in 2016, they made a request for God to heal David. He said, we're happy to report to you today that he is totally healed. To God be the glory, great things he has done. We've had some others come in that we'll be sharing with you. Amen. Give God praise. We have some others that have come in that we are going to share with you. and We'll be talking to you about over the, over the, the next uh, several weeks. But I believe that we should celebrate that. The work of the Spirit. We should celebrate the work of the Spirit. And let people know that we serve a God that is alive and well. And wants to move in their midst. So it's... Another point I want to draw out to your attention is that the initiation of the Spirit in Acts chapter 2, when they were waiting for the Holy Spirit to come, the promise of the Father to come, it happened in the context of a prayer meeting. And I will tell you, for us to be empowered by the Spirit, we have to be a people of prayer. That's why next week we're having this week of prayer and fasting, challenging you to give God your first, because I believe when you give God the first of your life, that everything that follows that, God will touch and God will bless. We're asking you to sign up for that 24-hour period of prayer. In fact, today I would love if our church would go back there and just fill those slots up to overflowing and said we will come and we will spend a segment of our, of our time that day and Friday to Saturday and we will pray. We will, we will get on the same page as a church and seek the face of God together for what God wants to do, not only in our church corporately, but what He wants to do in our families and in our individual lives. What God wants to do for the people that are not here yet will take prayer. So I encourage you to do that because we are utterly dependent on the Holy Spirit to fulfill our mission. Secondly, is biblically based. It's interesting that after the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost that Peter addressed the crowd. And when he addressed the crowd, 
This spineless, wimpy, I mean, this was the diary of a wimpy kid. Peter, just read about it. And now he's standing up, realizing he could be executed for sharing what he is sharing after the Holy Spirit came upon him. And yet he did it with boldness and courage. 3,000 people in one meeting gave their lives to Christ. It's powerful. It's Pentecost. But immediately following that, in Acts 2, verse 42, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. What they do? As soon as these people got saved, they began to give them milk. They began to feed these babies. These babies that just had experienced resurrection from death to life. They had come alive. They immediately began to devote themselves to the teaching of the word, the, the, the The word of God became central to them. In fact, what emerged, what initially emerged central to the entire discipleship process in the early church was the word of God. It really is, again, the fruition of the mission that Jesus gave in Matthew 28, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded. I think sometimes we become so Politically correct, even in the church, that we would never ever want to encourage people to obey. We never want to encourage people, teach them to obey, teach them to submit, teach them to walk after God, because we we wouldn't want to offend anybody. We wouldn't want to drive anybody away, but you know what? Jesus was really about sifting, not all about gathering. Jesus would give them the truth. Jesus would lay it upon them and said, hey, here's the way it needs to be. Here's the path of blessing. Here's what I want to do in your life. Sometimes people just walk away until he served them a meal. They come back around and he'd serve them a meal. He would feed them. And then many times when he began to say, hey, listen, this is what discipleship looks like. This is what following me looks like. Some of them decided to walk away. And we know that's going to happen. But at the same time that's happening, that's what the enemy wants to draw your attention to. At the same time that's happening, there's disciples that are gaining muscle. There's disciples that are growing inside and and they're growing to a depth that it doesn't matter what comes against them. It doesn't matter what storm they have to withstand. They will still be standing strong in the end. That needs to be our focus. The word of God imparting the word into people's hearts and lives. You see, really, it's not complicated. It's leading people to follow Christ in every facet of their lives by teaching them the word of God. You see, the Bible Bible tells us of the ways in which God revealed himself To mankind over a period of several thousand years. It provides a clear description of the nature of God and the attributes of God and who God is. It's completely different from the various and faulty concepts of God. All the garbage that is being fed to people in our world. It's being fed to our young people. So different. You see, you can't know who God is unless you get into his word. The Bible also helps us understand what the will of God is for our lives because His divine plan is very clear throughout every page. God will speak to us and and let us know uh, how to live. He will let us know the direction arrows of our lives. He will speak to us by the Spirit through the Word because they work in tandem. They work together. You see, the Logos, or the written Word of God, is divinely inspired and is our final authority and basis for living out our faith. We will be a church that literally places the Word of God as central and absolute truth because I know there are churches in America that are beginning to pick it apart. That are beginning to choose the Scriptures they want to live by. That are beginning to diminish the the, the authority of God's Word. The basis of God's word. Friends, it's 
not going to lead life change when we get away from the word. Even as Christ followers, the word of God is to be our daily bread, to nourish us, to feed us. And eventually we transition from milk, right, to meat. God begins to reveal things to us that we wouldn't have understood as a baby. But even in the natural, as babies grow up and become toddlers and become adolescents, teenagers, and become young adults and become adults and become seasoned adults, we grow, we stay healthy because of the Word of God. So here's what we want to do. We want to encourage everyone who calls Sioux Falls First their home to commit to reading the Bible every day. You know when you come here that the Word of God is central to our ministries. All of our ministries, it's a priority. We don't just pull out USA Today and current events. We don't believe they change lives. We can place those current events against the the backdrop of God's word and we can learn things. But the word of God is central. That's why we do JBQ, Junior Bible Quiz. Why we do Teen Bible Quiz. Because we believe in the power of depositing the word of God. It will not return void. It will not come back empty. But you have to commit as a follower of Jesus to do that Every day. It's daily bread. He could have said weekly. Could have said monthly. Could have said, get your Sunday bread. He didn't even say that. He said daily. In fact, just so I feel like I'm fulfilling the wishes of the staff, I'll write it down. Daily bread. Is that, isn't that good? Can you read it? Kind of? Hey! You like that? I just forgot till now. So, so here's the deal. If you read, you can read through the Bible in a year. If you read the Bible 11 minutes a day. Isn't that crazy? Only 11 minutes? And yet we always have excuses why we can't read the Bible. We're too busy and, 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 and we may grab a verse. We may not. Sometimes we go days and weeks and we've not picked up the Bible. 11 minutes a day. I mean, if you want to compare that to some of the things that don't matter that you do in your life, I mean, you'll be embarrassed. I will be embarrassed, right? 11 minutes. You can read through the Bible in a day. I believe Pastor Matt put some references on here of of where you can read the Bible through in a year. You can write some of those down. Um, You can call the office. We'll make sure you have them. Some great websites that will help you, give you plans, give you a process on how to do that. And let me just say, you may miss a day. Don't get discouraged. You just scratch it. Get back on. If you bucked off the horse, you get back on, right? And I want to encourage you just to make it a prayer. Don't, you know what? This was never meant. The spiritual exercises of prayer and fasting and getting in God's Word were never meant to be a, a, a tool of condemnation towards us. That wherever we are right now, God wants us just to grow in. God wants us to develop in these things. And so you may not get through the, the, the Word in a year, but you know what? If you get through half of it, It's probably more than you did this year, right? Just be committed to eating daily.